thing is, having been justified, that's past tense, having been justified in peace with God through faith. And the, the warfare is ended when we turn to Christ. Well, I shouldn't say it's ended. It maybe just begins. But it's uh, so. We have to go back to the Second World War before we find a complete surrender, unconditionally. Uh, when the or both either Germans or Japanese, they didn't surrender their automatic weapons, their tanks, one by one. They surrendered themselves. And when they surrendered themselves, then everything else went with it. And that's the same with us, with God. If we surrender to him, he immediately takes possession of our minds and thoughts and begins to change us moment by moment, day by day. And <clears throat> The one that speaks about justification by faith. I want to share the scripture that goes with that. This is Isaiah 32 and verse 17. And uh, 32 17 says this The work of righteousness will be peace, and the effect of righteousness, quietness, and assurance forever. A wonderful promise. These two go together. I'm going to share an experience. I hadn't thought of doing that until I was just sitting here today. But, uh, I used to sing somewhat. I had a friend of mine uh, asked me to send the, sing the Lord's Prayer at his wedding. And I said, sure. So uh, it was going to be with an organ. It was the first time I'd ever sung with uh, organ accompaniment. And uh, I only had one time to practice the night before. I started too long, or too too loud, and too high. And by the end, by the time I got through, uh, <laughs> I was screaming. <laughs> People were coming in the back door, and they were just jolted <laughs> when they heard what was going on. And so we called. But as I mentioned, I had no chance to practice after that. So what do you think I did through the night? <laughs> I worried all night long, all morning long. The, the wedding was in the afternoon. Came to the wedding and I sat on the front row, really stewing. I just I didn't know what the Lord was doing. And I started praying. I said, God, I need help. <laughs> and he directed me to this passage. That the work of righteousness shall be peace, the effect of righteousness, assurance forever. I said, Lord, I claim that promise. And you know, he gave me calmness. Amen. I was able to get through the, uh, get through the song. But I praise him for it. And even now, I still, from time to time, turn to that passage and say, God, you have promised Amen. that your work is that of peace and help and assurance. So Amen. I thought I'd share that with you. It's, it's a tremendous passage, I think. Amen. Now, I'm going to come back to Romans 5.1. And um, is the concept of justification by faith and the experience, is that practical? Is living by faith practical? And uh, we need to remember Ephesians also, in Him, in Christ, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the richness of His grace. Many take uh, advantage of the idea of salvation by faith, and if you just subscribe to theological ideas or creeds or something like that, you're home uh, free. But they've not brought justification by faith into a practical experience. And that's what God's looking for. He's more interested in our experience than he is with creeds and even theological concepts. Although I think concepts are good, we need to study them. But that's not the end of it. Now, Romans 5 begins with the fact of justification, that it is by faith, and then it proceeds immediately to consider the practical as uh, <clears throat> aspects of justification. Um, it's practical in every way, but nothing can be more practical than the forgiveness of sins. That's number one. And then, in these verses, Paul sets forth the practical, day-by-day -day existence of a believer uh, of justification by faith. There are nine practical features of justification by faith 
as listed here. Number one is peace with God. And I mentioned earlier that uh, peace with God comes when we lay down our armament against him. We stop fighting him. And uh, this is from uh, E.J. Wagner, 1891. He wrote this. It is clear that when we cease to fight against God, when we surrender, peace must be the result. And it always will be. As soon as we surrender our lives, our wills to God, God takes immediately possession of them, and he begins to change us on the inside to where we love his ways. And number, number two is uh, access into grace by which we stand before God. And number three, rejoicing in the hope that we have in the glory of God. Number four, we even rejoice in tribulations. Now that's a hard one sometimes. <laughs> Lord, why did this happen to me? No. But I think I mentioned the other night, I asked the question, have you ever paid, prayed for patience or faith? And I think many of us said yes. And uh, what happens? Well, it comes, uh, tribulations come, God is simply answering our prayers. Amen. We can grow in patience and in faith. And uh, we can thank him for it, even if we don't like it. <laughs> but patience, again, is uh, perseverance. And uh, we grow, we grow in grace, thank you. We grow in grace this way. And Revelation 14, 12, we've been looking at every night uh, this week. Here's the patience of the saints. And uh, they're obedient to God's law. They love his law. And they love the faith of Jesus. And they keep both. So patience is a result of faith in Christ and the faith of Jesus and also uh, God's law. And then experience or character. Character is being developed. This is a practical aspect of justification by faith. And then hope. And the blessed hope of Jesus Christ. That, that's the main hope that we have today. And I don't know about you, but it certainly appears that we're getting close to that time uh, now more than ever. And uh, for some of us, some of those graybeards may be laid to sleep before the Lord comes. But there's some in this room, I believe, will see the coming of Jesus Christ. And it seems that we're getting close to that point in time. Remember Elder Wheeler, he never thought he'd die. He was absolutely, he wouldn't even think it. He said he believed that he would live until the coming of the Lord. But uh, he, he's, he's resting. I believe he'll be raised up uh, to see Jesus come. Anyone, you know, said there's a prayer. In fact, let's go to Revelation 14. And uh, the result of the three angels' messages of, of uh, Revelation 14, there's a tremendous promise here for all those who die in the faith of those three angels' messages. Chapter 14 and uh, verse 14. He says, I looked, oh, no, I'm sorry, it should be verse 13. Uh, then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. I think the King James says, henceforth. And uh, so, write, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. And then the next one, the next verse is, as he beheld and saw Jesus coming in the clouds of heaven with a sickle. This is a reaping uh, harvest for his people. And the promise is that those who die in the faith of the three angels' messages will be raised especially to see Jesus Christ come. Amen. It's been their hope all through their lives, but now they have the privilege of seeing him. And they don't have to go through the Jacob's time of trouble, <laughs> but... Uh, but they were just before Christ comes, they'll be able to see him come in the clouds of heaven. And uh, so whether we live or die, if we remain connected with Christ, we shall see him come. What a time it will be. And, uh, and, and I'm sure he would, he longs to see us face to face even more than we want to see him. But he'll put within our hearts the, uh, the desire. And then there's no shame. The enemy's going to try to bring about shame upon God's people. But Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. If we're not ashamed of the gospel, we're not ashamed of Christ. And we're not going to put, be put to shame. Uh, the faith of Jesus eradicates that from our, our experience. And then the last one of this passage is, The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit, who comes to abide with us. He brings the righteousness of Christ to us. 
in the faith of Jesus. And this is what gives us peace, it gives us assurance, it gives us the, the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And these are the practical aspects of justification by faith in Christ alone. And we need to remember it's not merely theoretical, and uh, it's the opposite of speculation and abstraction. Uh, justification by faith in Christ alone means that God is actively working in our lives. And he's changing us day by day, moment by moment. And then I want to repeat, there's nothing more practical than justification by faith. For the simple reason, there's nothing more practical than the forgiveness of sins. When we know that we've been, we've been forgiven, we can thank God for it and uh, go on from there. Praise God. <clears throat> This is a thought we had the other night, I think the first night we were together. <clears throat> if you would stand through the time of trouble, you must know Christ. Amen. Absolutely essential. If we don't know him, we, we might have knowledge of all other things. But if we don't know him, we're going to miss out in eternity. But to know Jesus Christ, even if we don't know all things, we may not have everything figured out from the coming of Christ. If we know him, he will guide and direct our thoughts our lives as he best knows how. And so you don't have to worry about that. You must know him and appropriate the gift of his righteousness, which he imputes to the repentant sinner. All right, now we're going to get into the Protestant Reformation and the unintended consequences of justification by faith that Luther and those reformers presented, which God has given to us. Before we get into the Reformation itself, leading up to that Reformation, going back about 400 years <clears throat> or so, um, Urban II canceled penance for people who participated in the Crusades. And he had many people that would go on Crusades. Some died uh, as they were fighting the Muslims in the Holy Land. And, uh, but he said that <clears throat> their penance was canceled. They, they no longer had the do penance, but more than that, even their loved ones who were in purgatory, that's in the imagination, but, but uh, uh, if you pray or if you go on a, on a uh, crusade, uh, some of these people will be able to escape purgatory and go into heaven. And uh, here's a painting of him. There's a statue of him. And uh, <clears throat> later on, the indulgences were, were offered for those who <laughs> couldn't go on a, on a uh, crusade, but they would, if they could give cash contributions, they were able to um, get rid of penance and, and bypass uh, uh, purgatory. Purgatory, by the way, means uh, to be to purge. And both Luther and Calvin rejected pur purgatory on the belief of justification by faith. Because it's in justification by faith, we're purged, so we don't have to wait to the afterlife. It has to be done now, not, it will never be done afterward. The probation closes, and there's nothing left after that. <coughs> the, the selling of indulgences in the practice of asking payment for indulgences, a call on that, uh, was for the forgiveness of sins. So if you put up enough money, you can have your sins uh, forgiven. But that began in, in 1095, so you have about 400 years later, 1517, when Luther taxed his uh, <clears throat> theses, 95 theses on the Wittenberg Church. And he was not trying to attack the church of Rome. Uh, he did want to see, see it reformed. But because of a man by the name of Tessel, who was selling indulgences, and then the people were coming to Luther. He still, he still was a confessor. He would listen to people confess their sins, and, and he would give absolution. But these people were coming and said they didn't have to confess anymore because they, they paid money, and so their, their sins were forgiven, and their problems were forgiven. And Luther became a little bit unglued of that. And so he tacked these theses on the church door, not so much to uh, stir up things in the church itself, but he wanted scholars to get together and start discussing this, and he thought by that, people would, it would unfold and, and people would begin to see the light. And uh, so here's a painting of Tessel. He used a slogan such as this. As soon as a coin and coffer rings, 
the soul from purgatory springs. And he is, uh, they, were, they were rebuilding, or still building, I guess, on St. Peter's in Basilica uh, in Cole. And this is a moneymaker. But when they ran into the passage of justification by faith and died, that's the one they had to leave. They couldn't, uh, couldn't handle it. But this is a painting of Luther attacking the thesis on the church. And then a few years later, in 1521, he was called on the carpet to see the, or to confess, to change his position on several points. One of them was justification by faith. And so he went before the, many of the uh, people in, the, in the, the hierarchy of the church and also the uh, emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, Charles V. And uh, many wanted to kill, be killed immediately, but he did have a safe conduct. But the Protestants were concerned about that because they knew what had happened a hundred years before with Huss. Huss mm -hmm. came uh, to uh, a trial in Constant, and uh, they promised that he would have safe conduct, but he didn't. He was trying to die to the state. And Luther was ready to give his life. He, you know, he's, he thought that if, I, if I'm serving God, living or dying, uh, it, didn't, it didn't matter to him. But the, the Protestants that were following him said, no, you cannot go. <laughs> But he said, I am going. And he, did, and he went. And they were plotting to kill him. But uh, he, gave a, he gave a presentation in German. And then uh, there was quite much concern over this. And then someone asked him to uh, rethink what he had said because he, he, did, he would not overthrow his position. And they said, we want you to rethink that. You go to your room. And come back tomorrow and give a presentation again, or, or let us know what, what you believe. So the next day he came back, and uh, there was still some quibbling over what was going on. But someone finally said, You need to state your position again. So he spoke in Latin. He was absolutely exhausted, but he spoke in Latin so that there were people who didn't understand German could understand what he was saying. So everyone in that room understood what, what he was saying. And toward the end of his uh, uh, statement, this is what he said. He declared himself bound by conscience to the word of God. And he stated this. It is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. Amen. And uh, after that, they rushed him out of there under, well, actually, under cover of darkness. <coughs> they were going to crucify him. But they got, got, he got outside. And then a short time later, he was kidnapped by his protector. And spent a year in the Wartburg Castle. Translating the Bible from, uh, from both Hebrew, or not Hebrew, but uh, Greek and Latin into the German, first German Bible. And that was the best thing that could have happened for the people. It was a common language. And, uh, uh, and then after that, this thing really began to, to, small, small, to uh, continue. And we, met, we looked at this the other night. Luther taught that liberty of conscience is the most important part of faith. Let there be no compulsion. I have been laboring for liberty of conscience. Liberty is the very essence of faith. And this is in Roman VIII, the history of the Reformation. And then um, we have information of our own, or quoting from Roman VIII, uh, signed to the Times in 1883, 1884, 1888, 1911, the Great Congress. <coughs> she quotes what Roman VIII wrote about uh, Luther. Luther's writings, his statements. The liberty of conscience and justification by faith were joined together during the Protestant Reformation. Later, the Baptists were champions of this, and then after that, the Seventh-day Adventists. And here are some of the economic principles that came out of uh, the Reformation, specifically justification by faith, as we see it in the beginning of this morning. Justification by faith, then comes the liberty of conscience. And then the Protestant worked work ethic, free markets, free trade, capitalism, organization, the Protestant teaching of justification by faith led to these unintended consequences. Number one, the liberty of conscience. These two are, they go together, they can't be separated. From that came the priesthood of all believers, Amen. and then you have the separation of church and state, mm -hmm. and then religious and civil liberties. <clears throat> now remember, these were all unintended consequences of justification by faith. 
Luther himself did not understand what he was, uh, what the consequences of the Reformation until a little later. Then, actually, Luther turned away from um, the living of, of uh, living conscience. Uh, in 19, 1925, 1525, when you had the uh, peasant rebellion, he sided with the princes against these people. And as a consequence, today, German, Germany has a state church, the Lutheran church, and is paid for by everyone through taxes. They're you know, supported that way. I remember giving a study in Germany there was a group of teachers, and there was a couple of businessmen, and um, some pastors, and some non adventists And the two businessmen were, were uh, giving me a hard time. They were sitting on the other side of some tables, and uh, they were trying to distract. There were two, two Americans, and they were trying to split us, and we didn't allow it. <laughs> and, uh, but the non adventists were down on the end. They got up and marched off. They didn't, they didn't like what the other Germans were, do, were doing, trying to do to us. And uh, then there was a lady down on this end, and I found out later she was a teacher and talked with her at lunch. But she said, um, she said, you really made me mad. And I said, I knew you were agitated about something. What did I do wrong? <laughs> she said, you said that Luther uh, condemned Dowie. And she said, we were taught that Luther was the greatest doubter in the world because he doubted the, pap the papacy. I said, no. The, he, was a, he was a master of faith. It's through faith we understand. I said, so long as you doubt, you can never, do it. You can never learn anything. And uh, I said, what happened, the Church of Rome was based on uh, the Greek phil uh, phil philosophical underpinnings of doubt. If you learn to doubt well, you can learn well. And he, I said, Luther threw that out. That's why he started parochial schools. Uh, to get away from that. And she had a lot of relief. And she said, we were told this from the time we were small that uh, the Luther was a great doubter, and so they taught us how to doubt. And she decided she'd get on the path, the biblical path of learning by faith. Amen. <laughs> Hebrews, Hebrews 11, uh, verse 3 says that through faith we understand. And it's talking about uh, creation, but all in all uh, efforts, it is by faith alone that we learn. Mm -hmm. If we are Accept it by faith, and we will learn it somewhere along the line. But anyhow, so getting back to this, religious civil liberties are an unintended consequence of justification by faith. And also free markets and economies, uh, constitution and government. And then the United States of America is a it is an unintended consequence of justification by faith alone. Now, God has been kicked out of the Constitution. He's been kicked out of the Declaration of Independence. He's been kicked out of the Bill of Rights. But in the Declaration, maybe this afternoon, we get into some of this. Um, the Declaration of Independence, the first paragraph of, of the de Declaration, Jesus Christ, I mean, the Creator is mentioned, God, and then the last paragraph, he's called the judge. And uh, so it, it, the declaration is based on God's principles. And these are the things that came out of the Protestant Reformation. Now, there's been a shift in the th thinking of many Americans. And uh, they don't have a back background of where we came from, why we're here. Why we were established and where we're going. Uh, the educational system today has, has turned away from this. And uh, I've been in trouble sometimes when I've spoke on this. Uh, I had a young woman one time at a camp meeting, and I was talking about capitalism. And I, and I believe there have been many, many mistakes by capitalists. I have no, no question about that. But capitalism in itself is a Protestant principle. And uh, what's happening today, Marxism has come in and has thrown this uh, upsetting whole ar apple cart. And even though that uh, capitalism has been many failures, but it's the best thing we've got going. Missionary work it would not have succeeded as it has been had it not been for capitalism coming out of the United States and uh, led the world in, in this type of thing. But uh, there was a G20 uh, summit in uh, Toronto 
capitalism isn't working. Another world is possible. Hmm. That's Marxism. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, I gave a study on this about a little over a year ago. And friends of mine turned against me. They just called me up and said, you should have done that. <laughs> and uh, I, was talking, I was talking about Black, uh, Black Lives Matter, the communist organization. And many of my friends were sucked into this thing. And I had one man come and said, you've got, you got to take that down. I said, I've never put it up on the internet. And, uh, and but he kept after me, kept after me. He said, you know, you've got to, you got to uh, do something about this. I said, well, I'll tell you what. I'm going to ask a couple of questions to anyone who wants to know. And I'll ask this question. What has Black Lives Matter done for their own people on the streets of the cities that have been torn up? Oh, you can't ask that. I said, oh, yes, I can. <laughs> because they've done absolutely nothing for their own people. It's a tragedy. Yeah. Some of them have filled their pockets with money. Yeah. And um, they've, they've helped no one. In fact, there was a, there was a leader in New York, uh, the New York chapter, who uh, began, I know it was a lawsuit, but at least began to complain <clears throat> about some of the money that was going into <clears throat> professed communist pockets. Uh, the three women that started Black Lives Matter, they were not interested in helping their people. They lined their pockets with money. <coughs> and began to drink. And uh, not that friends turned against me. I was, I was really surprised. And one lady called me up and she said, take it down. And I said, can you tell me why? And take it down. And she screamed, take it out, take it out, take it out. And she hung up the phone on me. We were friends, you know. So it really, uh, really, I, I was surprised that these things have happened. But we're moving away from capitalism. The middle class is being eliminated in, uh, in America. And uh, they, they want to take us back to another system that happened before uh, capitalism really got going. But uh, and I'll come to this a little bit later. But German sociologist Max Weber wrote a book in 1905, and it was entitled The Protestant Ethic in the Spirit of Capitalism, in which he argued that capitalism historically emerged in Protestant countries because they instilled those virtues that led to the development of capitalism, which are hard work, honesty, frugality, thrift, and punctuality. These virtues, coupled with the idea of a calling, provided the impetus to end serfdom and establishing a free political and economic order. These all came out of the Protestant Reformation. And this, this is what the politicians today want to take us back to the feudal system. The, the ones who uh, provided the means for sustenance were the serfs and the peasants. Is this clear? No, it is clear. Okay. Um, they were the ones that had to do the manual labor. And then they were protected by knights, and, but knights took a lot of their money, and they just went up uphill from, to the bishops, the nobles, the kings, and finally to the pope. This is what I've, I've listened to the president of the United States talking about a new world order. This is what they're talking about. <laughs> Eliminate the middle class. The middle class is the backbone of the United States economically. But that was based on the Reformation concept and especially justification by faith. It's been forgotten completely uh, today. And uh, the, uh, the theology and the values of the Bible rediscovered by the Protestant reformers in the 16th century have been the principal movers in creating what we know as Western civilization. It was not Luther's intention to create a new civilization. That was not what he was thinking about. He intended to proclaim the righteousness of Christ, the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. His life was dedicated to a far more important activity than building an earthly nation or city. Nevertheless, Western civilization is an unintended consequence of its faithfulness to the Bible. We would not be moved from that. So again, the, uh, the Protestant Reformation itself was an unintended consequence. Uh, 
Lewis and Walker reformed Catholicism, but that didn't work. But there was a reformation that took place in, in the Protestant denomination. Protestants came out of that. Uh, also, constitutional government. There was not a constitutional government up until that point in time. Some would say, well, uh, they go back to Greece, uh, Athens, and, and uh, Rome. Rome was a republic for a while. But it was not the same. The United States is the only one that has been based on the principles of God's word. And <clears throat> we've uh, flourished because of that. Um, also, separation of church and state. During the feudal system, you got old, it was locked tight between the king and uh, the pope. And they battled for centuries who was going to be on top. And the pope finally made it. He became the dictator of the entire world at that time. Um, religious and civil liberties. There were none in those days. Freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, right to petition, habeas corpus. These are all, these came out of the Protestant Reformation. Uh, again, justification by faith. The free market system, capitalism and economics. Capitalism and the economic and political systems in which a country's trade and industry are controlled by private owners for profit rather than controlled by the state or by the church. And uh, what we have is, uh, there's a movement now that, uh, in fact, I listen to the Pope. He's, he wants to uh, take money from the rich and give it to the poor. Everyone wants to talk to him. Even your own, if you own property, uh, you you can own it, but you don't have a right to it. <laughs> if someone does not have any place to live, they can come and live in your house, at least on your property. This is amazing. He's, he's advocating this. And, uh, South Africa, that's what they have. Pardon me? South Africa. Yeah, that, that's another one. Yeah. But it's, it's going to be worldwide. Yeah, don't pay your taxes. Pardon See me? what happens. See what there you go, yes. <laughs> uh, but anyhow, the uh, capitalism is the economic practice of which Protestantism is the theory. And that's where it came from. Uh, and I want to say again, capitalism has gone overboard doing evil, <laughs> but it was not intended for that. God blessed Protestantism. He still does. Uh, and and, he, and he, he blessed the uh, Catholics also. Uh, if we adhere to some of the principles of, of uh, capitalism. But it is a Protestant principle, and uh, God opened this up. He opened the United States up specifically, not for capitalism per se, but for the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Amen. Amen. This is why we are we're organized as a government to give freedom of religion to all men, or no religion at all. You, 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 we should be able to live with people who do not believe in God, we try to convert them, of course, <laughs> but they have a free choice. Amen. This is why the United States was, was established. Amen. God had in mind you and me today <laughs> to carry the torch. We're the only ones. Well, the Baptists were for a long time, but they've, they've been uh, shifting from that. But um, I believe Seventh-day Adventists are going to be the last one standing, dealing with liberty, liberty conscience. But if it's not joined to justification by faith, it is nothing. We'll not be able to stand just on liberty of conscience. We need to know Jesus Christ on a one-to-one -one basis, and then there's nothing we'll be afraid of. Amen. Amen. We're coming to the time when we need to know him. Amen. And he, he gives us the time to, to get to know him. It doesn't matter what background we come from. We don't matter what condition we've been in. We don't, it doesn't matter what condition we're in right now. Mm -hmm. It will respond to Jesus Christ. He will change us, wonderfully change us. And he'll give us the strength Amen. to not only to live under adverse conditions, but to pre be able to present the gospel in clear words and thoughts that will catch the attention of the world. And uh, we need it. We need the power of God in our lives, individually, corporately, and it will come if we'll allow him to do so. It's a simple matter to simply turn our, our wills over to him. God, I surrender my will. I, I told God, I'll, just, I'll share an experience I had. Uh, when I accepted uh, Adventism, became an Adventist, I think I believe it was once saved, always an Adventist. You know, once saved, always saved. And I remember one time I was in a, my apartment, this was maybe 
three or four years after I've been baptized. And the Lord has entrusted me to surrender my will to him. And I argued with God. I said, God, I've already said surrender my will to you. Why do I have to do it now? <laughs> he gave me no rest. So I was on my knees. And I'm like a pouting child. Okay, God, I'll surrender. <laughs> Immediately I had peace. <laughs> that had been missing for some time. And I, that's what I learned. Uh, I would say almost once they know it's once you made a decision, you're baptized, you're home free. And uh, I got to think, you know, when it comes to surrender of the will, it's not a yearly thing, not a monthly thing, not a daily thing. Hour by hour, we're, 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 we're in con conflict many, many times throughout the day. And if we simply say, Lord, I can't handle this, I surrender my will to you, he will immediately take it. And if we don't, if we're not willing, we can simply say, no, I'm not willing, but I'm willing to be made willing. Amen. He will accept that. I'm, I know he will. <laughs> I've experienced that myself. I've told him things I didn't want to do. Wasn't going to go there, do this. And <clears throat> he persuaded me that I ought to. <laughs> so he's, got, he's better than we deserve. Amen. I tell you, he'll never give up on us. Never. He'll hold us by a hand. We talked about this the other night. He'll hold us by a hand that will never let us go. If we'll, if we'll not, we can take our hand out of his, and we kick and scream and get away from him, but uh, he will hang on as long as he possibly can, <clears throat> and not any longer let us go. But anyhow, the, uh, uh, the outcome of Luther's struggle to understand justification by faith was <clears throat> the unintended Protestant Reformation, and also the unintended consequence of the dramatic impact, not only in Christianity, but also the entire Western civilization. And it has, it has gone to, to, to the world. Um, the principle of Christianity has been resisted for the most part. But you know, every free government today, or every free country, is modeled after the United States, apart from the religious aspect. And now we have people in the United States, politicians and the rest, they're trying to get rid of God in, um, in our existence. And, and you got, you got the extreme on one side, then you got the extreme on the other. The, the, the ultra-right, they want to make God the centerpiece. To be a Christian nation, have Christian laws, that's coming. That's, that's, there's going to be a switch from the left to the right one of these days. It's going to, it's going to be interesting to see. Uh, because it's, all, it's going to be good, good language. <laughs> but, uh, but it's going to be deadly. Mm -hmm. and right now, we're in a deadly situation, too, the way, the way people are, are headed. But... Anyhow, as I mentioned, the United States of America is the unintended consequence of justification by faith. And <clears throat> the events that led up to the Democratic Republic of America, why did God choose America? I think we've already talked about this. Uh, as the birthplace and cradle of the Advent message. <clears throat> it was because America was far distant from Europe, the Union of State, it was the Union of Church and State that was both on the mainland and in England. Both of them were, uh, were bogged down with this sort of thing. God had to get his people out of there in order to, uh, to free them. And as we, we talked about this uh, from night to night, the Declaration of Independence, 1776, the Constitution, 1789, the Bill of Rights, 1791, this all prepared the way for the three angels' message. It could not have been in any other nation in the world except this country right here. That's why we exist. That's why the United States exists. <clears throat> when, we, when the United States turns from these principles, we're going to go down the tube. Amen. And that's coming. It's going to come from the people, <coughs> not necessarily from the politicians. Mm -hmm. But in Revelation 13, it's the people that will vote into laws that will bind mm -hmm. the conscience of men and women. But there's going to be a, a dramatic change. Amen. We think we've got it easy going on, but I'm telling you, we need to know Jesus Christ. Amen. I don't want to scare anyone, but there's going to be changes in our lifestyles, changing in our eating habits. All of these things are going to, uh, we're going to be affected by. God is going to have a people that's going to reflect the image of Jesus Christ, Amen. and people will be drawn to Him. But that's, that was the purpose of this country being established. That's the sole purpose of Southern Adventism. Prepare people for the second coming of Christ. So the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, prepared the way for the Advent message and the proclamation of the everlasting gospel, Revelation 14. 
unintended consequences of losing sight of justification by faith. Today we see the gains of the Reformation have been slipping away from Protestantism and from America. And the main reason, I'm sure there's several of them, but the main reason is because we've dropped the ball. We're talking about Protestants. We've dropped Amen. the ball on <coughs> the message of salvation. And that's happened in 1844. We've been Amen. in a downward uh, spin ever since then. But God has a message that wants to bring people up and will if they accept it. But the losses that we're saying to, seeing today, the losses of liberty of conscience, have you heard anything about this? This COVID thing? Um, the, it's not the mark of the beast. There are people who are saying it's the mark of the beast. Not the mark of the beast. But there's, there's intrusion on liberty of conscience. And I think the COVID situation was simply a vehicle for those in powerful places that want to control people. That's what it is. Look what's yeah. happening in Canada. Absolutely yeah. atrocious what, what uh, Trudeau is doing. Absolutely. And uh, as a dictator. But there are people here who want to do the same thing. And they were yeah. they were on that pathway until the Supreme Court slapped down some of this stuff. But we're, we're, it's, it's going to come back. It, it, not from the left, it'll be from the right. But <clears throat> the religious and civil liberties, these are beginning to uh, be degraded among us. Uh, capitalism and economic, this has been on the ground downside for several years now, and probably, I would say, 10 to 20 years, there's been a movement to, to get us out of this, and again, go, go into uh, the failed um, the failed experience of uh, Marxism. <laughs> Marx was a failure in his life. Germany was a failure in Marxism. Russia was a failure with Marxism. Um, China was a failure of Marxism. That's the way, that's the reason uh, China turned to capitalism. That's how they're making their money today. And, uh, and they may be making an economy, I don't know. But for their failure, because there is not the concept of righteousness by faith. Amen. It, it cannot stand. And uh, so what's happening today in fact, I've read of uh, Marxists out of Germany that they left Germany because of the heat of Hitler. They came to the United States, set up some of their educational institutions. Many of these men became teachers or teachers in our universities. Mm -hmm. And that's how this is because in almost every university, almost every college is teaching Marxism. Yep. It's just beyond my uh, imagination how this could even happen. Yeah. But anyhow, uh, so free market system, that the people want to do away with that. Make everyone equal. And uh, <laughs> constitutional government, separation of church and state, you've got both Protestants and Catholics are trying to work uh, work out this position where we can have a union of church and state. To have the state do what the church wants them to do. Yeah. And uh, so I'm going to share with uh, <coughs> Buffy was involved in this. <coughs> a number of years ago, uh, we had an invitation to go to the um, Bishops' Conference on Religious Liberty in Washington, D.C. And uh, Raymond had called me, asked me, we discussed these things from a uh, spiritual standpoint. And um, he said, would you be, would you be willing to uh, speak to senators and people that are in high places if I could find a room in D.C.? He said, I want you to talk about justification by faith and religious liberty. I said, yes, you can do it. But the cost was too high, just tens of thousands of dollars <laughs> to get a room. You know? mm -hmm. And so he went around to the colleges. He went to St. Mary's and uh, talked to the political science leader uh, of the department. And he thought it was a good idea. But he said, uh, well, he said I'll tell you what, I want to give you an invitation to come to our, we're going to be talking about religious liberty. The bishop, all bishops in the United States are going to be here. And so Raymond called me and said, do you want to come? I said, absolutely. <laughs> and so, so we went. And uh, there is a beautiful campus. And we met uh, Cardinal Timothy Dolan. Um, the, uh, let's see. Yeah, he gave the opening address. Uh, this is a picture I didn't get at, the, at that meeting. But uh, I 
got off the internet, but I saw some tremendous garments <laughs> worn by these missing. The Trappists had a beautiful tan flowing robe. It was, it was gorgeous. All of them were nice. And, uh, <clears throat> but uh, I didn't think I'd <laughs> change my suit. <laughs> but Mosby and Raymond, myself, and uh, Lincoln and Steve, we were, we were, we stuck out like a sore thumb. <laughs> because if we were dressed in a nice dress, we were all in suits. And we were right up front. We had the uh, Dolan, here's, here's a picture of Dolan speaking. It looks like he's looking right at us. We were kind of an angle from him. We were at a table right up next to the platform. And when he got through, he came down the platform. He, he pulled up a chair beside me and he started pumping his questions. And when he, when he got all the answers he wanted, he said, well, I've got to go, I've got to go. And then Lincoln Steve jumped up and he said, uh, I'd like to have an interview with you. I'm the editor of the uh, of list of, of uh, Visits of Liberty. He said, yeah, I'll give it to you. So he did. And, uh, and we, I got a little bit of that here. But anyhow, uh, <coughs> the Cardinal gave an opening address uh, at this conference on religious liberty. And uh, he spoke. He said, one of the great grand principles of religious freedom and a Roman Catholic commitment to protecting this freedom for everyone. Now that's what they're saying. But it's not their bill. It's religious freedom for themselves, primarily. Yeah. Now they've got to take in Protestants and Muslims and things like that. But when the time comes, it's going to be it's going to be number one. Yeah. Uh, but this one, he said, he seemed to hesitate. He paused and then said, "There was a time when Roman Catholics held that error has no rights." Mm -hmm. And then that uh, Lincoln wrote this down. And the comments sparked much debate later, at which time a Catholic historian explained that indeed there had been a seismic shift for the Roman Catholic Church. And the, the bishop did not seem to understand this. This is, it was puzzling to me. But I thought, well, they're a, a, a new generation since the 50s and 60s. You know, the 60s was Vatican I, or Vatican II, rather. And at that time, they thought they had changed. People thought they had changed. They have never changed. Exactly. They still are based on the Council of Trent <coughs> opposing the uh, Protestant Reformation in the 1500s. And uh, so anyhow, I've got here, these are some of the things, this is uh, Pope Pius IX. Uh, Can you see him in the middle? Yeah. Uh, by the way, I, I'm going to put in a request. Hmm. You folks need to get another computer, or get another uh, uh, <coughs> Checker. Pardon me? Projector? Oh. Yes, projector. Yeah. So we have clear, crisp pictures that come out. Um, it's only suggested, but we can run it. Uh, anyhow. No, uh, I've seen you. See, I'll, I'll show you how clear this is in mind. See, you see that? Yeah. The colors are bright and, and bushy. But anyhow, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Pope, this is the ninth. The uh, Pius the ninth. He said, uh, uh, let me go, I think it's the next one. Well, all of these are, here, the first picture, oh, oh that's better. Um, first one, uh, we'll look at them in public order. Just a little bit of a uh, uh, contracture. Uh, this is where he's attacking the United States, especially the liberty conscience. And uh, this man on the near right is the president of the States, Confederate States. And this Pope was the only head of any state or church who wrote to him, encouraging him, and called him Mr. President. He's the only one that did. But he was definitely against the United States of America all through his, his, his uh, operation. Here's a, this is uh, from the Library of Congress, 1855 engraving, engraving titled The Aim of Pope Pius IX. We see him in this one. The U.S. Constitution is, is crumbling it in his right hand. And notice what he's doing. He's stepping on the U.S. flag. And over here, he's killing the eagle. These are symbols of liberty. Yep. And the law of liberty in the Constitution based on God's law. Now, this is what, this is his aim. As I mentioned, uh, he was the only one who wrote to Jefferson Davis, calling him Mr. President. 
He said things that almost pulled us through to the north. Um, what he did, if you're just a man wrote what he is, the average Christian student of American history is unaware of how close Pope Pius IX came to dissolving the Union <coughs> after the Civil War. For a sobering insight as to how the Vatican can interfere with foreign governments, consider the chaos incited by a single letter sent to Pius by Pius IX to Jefferson Davis in 1863. Responding to correspondence from Davis, dated 23 September 1863, the Pope's reply was formally addressed to Jefferson Davis, President of the Confederate States of America, originally. This subtle salutation gave the Confederacy a badly needed vote of confidence for His Holiness. What followed next is quite unnerving. Whereas the desertion rates of the Northern Army showed 16% of German, for Germans, 0.5% for Native Americans, 07 for all others, the Irish figures skyrocketed to 72 percent. <coughs> the above figures indicate that out of every 10,000 Irish enlistees, almost all Catholics, there were over 33 times as many desertions as among all the other groups put together. The point to be made here is not only the historical one that the Vatican intervened in the agonies of the Civil War, but that in a different context, in a different way, can do the same in today's conflicts, be they military or political. Mm -hmm. and they're working both of these today. Um, we're going to have to stop at this. <laughs> um, anyhow, I think it's better. Uh, one, one other thought, maybe. Uh, the next day after we got out of the meeting with the bishops, we went over to a discussion, Raymond and I, and uh, they were discussing the, uh, some of the concepts they dealt with the day before. And they said, we're going to open this up for questions and answers afterwards. Discussion. And so I was sitting on the, on the inside aisle, and the guy with microphone was on the other side, giving the people, and I raised my hand, and he nodded to me, pointing, and said, yeah, I need to be right over to give me the microphone. But he never showed up. So I raised my hand again, and uh, nothing happened. I did, I raised it three or four times. I heard a, a booming voice behind me, there's a man got his hand up, give him the microphone. <laughs> Nothing. I, they would not. They knew who we were. Again, we stuck out like sore thumbs. And so it never, it never got to me. And I was not going to bring in any conflict whatsoever. They had some good discussion. I probably would have commented on that and maybe asked a question or two, but uh, it, it never happened. This, this is in Georgetown, and this is a gender institution. And, uh, but anyhow, that's, uh, we don't have to stop and do that. But I, will, I need to uh, give some encouragement on all this. Uh, Him that cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast out. 
if you have nothing else to plead before God but this one promise from your Lord and Savior, you have the assurance that you will never, never be turned away. It may seem to you that you're hanging upon a single promise, but appropriate that one promise and it will open to you the whole treasure house of the riches of the grace of Christ. Cling to that promise and you're saved. Him that comes unto me, I will no ways cast out. Amen. Present this assurance to Jesus and you are as safe as though inside the city of God. Is that good news? Amen. 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 Good news. And then one other letter to a friend. You find that in the testimonies of the minister. This is one of the last letters she wrote to a lady friend. Jesus declares, him that cometh unto me, I will no wise cast out. That is, there is no possibility of my casting him out, for I have pledged my word to receive him. This is one of the last messages that she gave. Christ stretched out his hand. He wants to take us by the hand and lead us. If, if he gets our hand, he will never let it go. Absolutely impossible. We can kick him in his feet or whatever, step on his toes. We may, we can force ourselves away from him, but he will never give up on us. Mm. We better pray. Thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you so much. Even though there's turmoil and around us, and we're going to be faced with other things, but we need to know you. And knowing you, we can face anything. So not in our own strength, not at all, but in the power of Jesus Christ. I pray that he'll become more and more real to us day by day, moment by moment. In his name.
you, Lord, for your goodness to us. May our hearts respond to you. Set confession of the mouth and faith from the heart. That you will secure us in your kingdom. Keep us in You cannot keep ourselves. And we trust that you will do so. We know you will. Thank you.